Have you ever wondered about the beginnings of Portugal and how a medieval king fought for independence? And no, just me? Oh, okay. I know what you're here for. You're here for the story of how Portugal fought against their mortal enemy and used the church to do so. No? Okay. I guess it is the one about the intrigue and civil war. No, not that? It's about the corpse love story thing, isn't it? It's always about the corpse love story thing with you. Yes, today we will also be talking about that. Hello and welcome to His and Hers History and I am Steph and this is my host Aaron. Hello, how are you? How's that intro, Aaron? Confusing because <laughs> I'll be honest, I've got no knowledge of Portugal mm-hmm. at all. Um, I know nothing of any of their history, none of it, nothing about their royal family, nothing about who they conquered, who conquered them. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you're going to only find out about the start of it today. Start of it, okay. If you are new to this podcast, let me catch you up to speed. Each week, one of us is the host and brings a historical topic to the table that the other person gets to listen to and the catch is they know nothing about the topic. Can confirm. <laughs> By doing this, we can have a lighthearted look at the past with genuine reactions and you guys can laugh along with us as we dissect and potentially ruin history. I think that's more my thing, isn't it? Ruining history, whereas yours is more factual and um, that's probably more accurate, I would say. I may be ruining love stories oh, Okay, today. well, I like it. I like the sound <laughs> of it. I like where this is going. So I've set this up in three parts today. Three part series, okay. And our part one is called Mother Issues. Mother Issues. So what's the actual topic exactly? Because you mentioned a lot of things in the, the intro. The start of the Portugal kingdom and we're going to look at a couple of kings. Okay, so how it... Yeah. Leading up to the last king of like the first dynasty. Okay. So after that... There you go. Well, this is family. with all other um, topics we've covered. I've known at least a little bit about this. I'm going in completely cold turkey. I know nothing about this. So Don't know so if the could, listeners will be going into cold turkey because there's one very famous story. Yes. I suppose if they're looking at this one, they probably know something about it. Don't Maybe. They? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So part one, mother issues. Before the first king of Portugal's time, Portugal was only a county in the country of Leon Castile. The future king was born between the years 1106 and 1109 to Henry of Burgundy and Teresa, who were respectively Count and Countess of Portugal. So it wasn't even a country. Portugal was like a county. It was a little county. Of what? What? Uh, Leon Castile. What's it? What's so that? this is around is the like area French? of Spain. Oh, okay, right. So that's the area we're looking at. Although Portuguese will definitely say they're not Spanish. Yeah, that's they very clear about yeah, that. There's a bit of a, there's a rivalry there, isn't there, I between so, Portugal yes. and Spain, yeah. So, fun fact about Teresa, she was actually the illegitimate daughter of the king of Leon and Castile. A scandal. Mm. A lot of illegitimate Oh, sons that and history daughters. is littered with illegitimate children and heirs and things like that. So, our first king's name was Alfonso. Oh, boss name. Get used to that name. Alfonso. <laughs> So this first story about his life is unsubstantiated, but a couple of historians have tried to prove it right. Okay. So I wanted to highlight it because it's a great story that paints a picture of sort of the relationship that's to come. So Alfonso was apparently born with crippled legs. Oh, no. Not a good start. (laughs) Teresa abandoned him and did not give him the care he needed. And Alfonso was sent to live and be raised by a steward. That's also a theme with these like, royal families. Mm-hmm. If someone's born with any deficiency, like they're pretty much cast aside and they're like, we're not, we're not going to look, look at you or deal with you, no. which is sad. Well, you need the strong blood. They're yeah, well, appa- apparently it, like, aggressive. it doesn't matter if his legs are, there's something wrong with his legs. He's still your child, He's still your son. Anyway, continue. To our modern eyes, that would be the case, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's looking at it through uh, yeah, a modern person's eyes. Now, while Alfonso was with his steward, and of course this is medieval times, Alfonso was apparently cured by a saint and no longer had crippled legs. So what, if he was lazy? Like his legs just... Oh, they, they were like, cured by a saint. By a saint, oh, obviously like, yeah, religious. Hmm. Yes. So he was taken back to Teresa, who continued to abandon <laughs> him, stating that he is now ugly. <laughs> she just did, just had it in from to begin with. As I was reading this, it sort of reminded me of um, the Duke of Hastings. For yeah, I was <laughs> going to mention that at the start. I forgot to mention that that um, the Netflix series, um, what's it called, Bridgerton. Bridgerton, which I actually didn't mind. It wasn't too bad. Oh, 
revealing some personal information. Yeah, well, you it's you not heard it here first. Aaron likes Bridgerton. It's not up my alley normally, that sort of thing, but I enjoyed <laughs> it. So he came to his mum and he's like, look, mum, my legs work now. Will you love me now? And she's like, ugly. <laughs> ugly. ugly. <laughs> no. <laughs> so Alfonso. this is very much the character of Teresa. Um, I'm, th- I'm thinking of a few words <laughs> that might describe her, yeah. <laughs> Alfonso instead was raised by his steward who had also trained him in the art of war. Nice. So he fixed his legs through, like, training, probably. Probably. Oh, no, sorry, the saint. The saint, yeah. (laughs) So maybe with our 2020 vision, Teresa didn't make the wisest choice. When Alfonso was still only a toddler, many political changes took place. In 1112, after the siege of Astorga, Henry, his father, died, leaving Teresa to rule alone a challenge she apparently did not mind as she named herself Queen of Portugal, a fact that was actually supported by the Pope, however, not as well well received by her half-sister. The reason that this is important is because Teresa's half-sister, who is obviously also the king's daughter, became queen because her father had died around the same time that uh, Henry had died. So So jealousy. And they both thought that they were the rightful heir to the throne. So Teresa's plans were quite grand and she took her opportunity. Her luck was quickly shot down though as she was forced to renounce her title as queen and reaffirm her vassalage under her half-sister. What's a vassalage? Uh, loyalty. So oh, lo- so her half-sister came in and was like, oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Yeah. This isn't going to fly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm the queen, right? And you're going to be my underling and you're going to admire me and stuff. Pretty much. She sounds like, well, not a nice person, but someone that probably wouldn't have stood for that. Is my guess anyway. Mm, she wanted to climb that ladder. Don't think she's going to give up so easily. She wanted to climb that corporate ladder, you know. A corporate the, ladder of royalty. Be the CEO of Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> now, for poor Alfonso, he was raised in a separate household. However... Sound, uh, sorry, um, that sounds like an awesome idea to be raised in another household because she sounds from terrible. From her? Yes, yeah. I agree. <laughs> he dodged a bullet, I reckon. <laughs> So being raised in separate households also meant they grew up with very separate political views. And Alfonso's views started to have an impact on the relationship between his mother and himself. Oh, so they did have a relationship, even though she had had nothing to do with him, (laughs) pretty much. Well, she was, well, he's basically meant to be the Count of Portugal at the moment since his father's died. So she tolerated him in that aspect, like? Not really. She took control of what he should have had as well. Wow, stone cold. (laughs) In fact, their political views were so different that at around the age of 12, around the year 1120, Alfonso was exiled for taking the side of the Archbishop, (laughs) who was Teresa's sworn enemy. So back in those times, if you're a royal, I suppose um, exile was like, go to your room, pretty much. No, it was leave the county. Yeah, I know, but like, that's a really extreme of like, you're. You are breaking the rules, mm-hmm. go to your room. But he was but exiled. it was a very far away I, room. I understand it's very extreme, <laughs> but I'm just trying to correlate, you know, make it relative to our time and go to your room, it's Alfonso. M- Alfonso, go to another country and think about what you've done for several months or years. Now, I did say that the Archbishop was Teresa's sworn enemy and she wasn't short of those. So much so that she needed to make an alliance with the Count of Galicia who was also her lover. Oh. Mm. She scandal follows this woman everywhere. Oh, she does not care. She Maybe will she's like a modern woman, you know, yeah. just doing her thing. So this alliance worried the aristocracy of Portugal and eventually the people started to rally around the young Alfonso. As you do. I mean, it wouldn't be hard not to rally around him when she's the mother. And anyone that probably knows or has had anything to do with her would see that she's a stone cold. She sort of didn't care uh, about making friends. It was all about no, power it was all and about enemies. Climbing that corporate ladder. <laughs> At the ripe old age of fourteen, Alfonso was deemed an adult in medieval terms, and went on his way to make himself a knight of the Cathedral of Zamora. From here, he raised an army, defeated his mother and her lover, and even his cousin, Whoa. the King Leon of Castile. That, that escalated, wow. Mm-hmm. Seems like um, surely she would have seen the potential in him because that's like but he's he quite dri- like he's quite driven and stuff. Obviously, to to be successful, surely she would have seen that as a 
like a win-win for her. She probably didn't him. even see that. She yeah, probably well, didn't even didn't notice him. It. Well, when your son's born with abnormal legs and you mm-hmm. send him away, you're probably not <laughs> going to like them. Eh? Yeah. So Alfonso <laughs> proclaimed himself Prince of Portugal and for good measure sent his mother to a monastery in Lyon. Is that like exile? Yeah, or but I think like it's probably worse because she's not free. She has to like Yeah, that's sort of like a nice way of exiling her. Not really. I think it's probably worse. Yeah, probably. Well, you said to live as a nun, her, basically. So what, like in combat? On guard, mother. Well, her army he did. Well, His army defeated her army. He then set his sights on the persistent problem in medieval Portugal's eyes anyways, the Moors. Do you know who the Moors are? The Moors, like the surname Moors? No. <laughs> Down the road? <laughs> it was the Islamic people. So it's basically around crusade times. So what, what part so of the country? Like, oh, sorry, still, they're in Portugal. Oh, so okay. they're fighting yeah. for territory and trying to get So just territory. different religious beliefs. Yeah. Basically, yeah. So Alfonso's father was a popular ruler before him as he had actually been able to defeat the Moors and send them back um, to gain more territory for Portugal. Alfonso wanted to do the same thing and in 1139 he overwhelmingly overpowered the opposing forces and won more land for Portugal. Just a quick little side note here. Mm -hmm. Throughout history they always say like uh, a certain religion or army defeated another one but they always like the fights go on for centuries so they didn't actually defeat them. They just said, oh, we've beaten you today. They sort of pushed them back. They're like, go away and like, (laughs) yeah, we'll we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back in 10 years. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> we'll, we'll defeat you again. It's like they never actually defeat them. They just beat them in a battle. So I guess getting more land for Portugal sort of cemented his claim on Portugal Yeah, but as that's well. another thing about history is they get some land and then a century or two later the other ones take it back. And it's just like, what's the point? Anyway, good on him. Power. Go, go Alfonso. So the troops were so enamoured with their victory, they called for Alfonso to be king of Portugal. This would mean that Alfonso would be the king. However, he had to be acknowledged by the Pope and the neighbouring lands as well. To legitimise his claim, Alfonso married the daughter of the Count of Savoy. He sent ambassadors to negotiate with the Pope, built churches and monasteries. And it also didn't hurt that he had a big part in gaining Christian land from the Moors and settling new colonists. Alfonso left a Christian stamp on Portugal and the surrounding areas. So looking at it from like a... Portuguese perspective and a Christian perspective. He was a successful leader, like he did a really good job. Mm. Yeah, so, so he's, he's called the father of Portugal. Well, there you go. He seems like a kingdom. He came from um, less than um, ideal beginning for him, but he made something of himself. So, well done, Alfonso. Bravo. <laughs> so that leads us to part two. A pattern is forming. Mm. Alfonso had a son called Sancho, the first of Portugal, who became its second king. And was born with funny legs. So he was exiled. He was not. No. He turned his sights like his father before him to the Moors and was well known as the populator, ensuring that Christian faith was well established. So I wanted to mention this second king because he actually had two daughters who were beatified, which is one step behind canonization, which highlights how well liked the Portuguese were already in their early days as a kingdom. So one daughter to be beatified was Sancha who actually started her own monastery. There was also another daughter. Her name was Teresa. So, like, the name of his mother. Yes. Who who he hated. I find that who very strange. exiled <laughs> and hated his legs. Well, his thought he was ugly. It's his grandma, was it? Yeah. Sorry. Thought he was ugly. Thought he had bung legs that didn't work. Had him exiled. Had different beliefs. He defeated in battle. Um and he chose to name yeah. his daughter after. That's strange. I found that strange. I personally as well. would not do that. No, name someone my child you might after have someone hated. I despised. Yeah, but maybe there was a twinge of love there. Maybe he still maybe. felt something for her. Maybe I wouldn't personally. So he obviously had high hopes for this daughter because she was married off to the king of Leon. Nice. After giving him three children, he annulled their marriage because they were actually first cousins. Ew, gross. Mm. Um, yeah. That. Why did he not? Just not marry her because yeah, that's, their blood that cousins. was that's exactly gross. my thought. Why was it only after three children he was like, "Yeah, we're first he, cousins." He just needs time to this. think about it. He came to his senses <laughs> after after the third child. He's like, "You know what? This is kind of gross, actually." So I'm going to stop. Yeah, I find it strange that he had no issue when yeah. they actually got until married. the third child came. Yeah. On. So after that, he married again, but also annulled this marriage because they were second cousins. I was going to say, let me guess, second cousins. Mm-hmm. Um, again, ew, gross. But he's slowly working his way 
further away from his bloodline, so I guess that's a good thing. I mean, it's probably not a bad strategy. You find a girl you like and make sure Mary she's your within cousin. your within your family so that you can annul the marriage if it's just not working out. I guess, but that's, that's your cousin. That's gross. <laughs> it's still and gross, And also, yes. what is it with kings? Keeping in the family, yes. No, no. What, what is it with what? kings and stuff? Um, having multiple marriages and multiple kings, uh, sorry, multiple children, because that's going to cause problems down the line because there's going to be different children from different sides of the family that think they have oh. rights to the Well, to Aaron, the you've predicted what happened next. Well, <laughs> history <laughs> always predicts itself. History always does this. So there was disputes between the king's children, so Teresa's children and oh, his second no, wife's I didn't children, see that coming. as to who would take the throne. So Teresa stepped in and allowed the second wife's eldest son to take the throne of Leon. So she mediated the whole situation. Oh, wow. I would have thought um, the first lot of children, the first three, would have been um, the best in line because they're the most pure of blood. Oh. Yeah, gross. Yeah. I know, but they're the most pure of blood. I guess in that they could messed have, they up way, They could have thrown that card down <laughs> with all their um, deformities and stuff. So after the success and dispute, Teresa returned and took her convent vows after years of living as a nun. So I thought it was interesting little tidbit about the princesses and they were beatified in 1705 by the Pope at the time. So it does take a little bit of time for people, but I couldn't really find out why they were so special. So hundreds of years later, is that what you mean? Yeah. Not sure why they were chosen, but maybe it was just her selflessness and Allowing another woman's child to be oh, the king. I, I guess maybe uh, <laughs> being a, me- the f- a mediator, yeah, I guess. So moving on to the next king, Sancho the first son was Alfonso the second of Portugal. Uh, runs in the family. It does, Get it the does. names in the family. Nice. He introduced the first written laws of the land and weakened the powers of the church. Thou shall not marry your cousin that and then not breed with them. That should have been in the <laughs> first rule. So he weakened the powers of the church and centralised powers on himself. This was Mm. all pretty standard as Portugal had now become a power in itself and had solidified its claim as a kingdom. Sounds like um, Caligula, who we covered a couple Mm. of weeks ago, how he tried to take all the power away from the people that were running the empire and give it to himself. But are you sensing a bit of a problem taking the powers away from the church in medieval times? Not a great choice. Yeah, not a great choice. I mean, they were a superpower and still are probably. Moving along to his next son, Sancho II. Um, you said keeping like with the themes, a lot of names reoccurring. Well, remember this part is called A Pattern is Forming. Well, in my family, um, the firstborn son is called David. I was yep. the secondborn son. I have a brother called David. So I guess we're kind of royals um, <laughs> in my family, yeah, because every, every other firstborn male is called David going back for generations. I don't think maybe, that gives you a claim oh, maybe to a we're title. Bread too. <laughs> oh, God. No. Why move on. That please move on. <laughs> Moving along to his son, Sancho II of Portugal. He had a tough rule after his father, as the country had been excommunicated by the Pope for his attempts at reducing the church's power within the country. Idiot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, not true, a great move. True. Now, here, here they, you go, son, deal with this. But have a listen to this. You'd think you'd really want to repair these relationships and get them back in the... Yeah, I guess so. You, could you know, draft, the good hey, books. My, like, I'm in charge now. Let's undo... So they did done. draft up a Ten Commandment treaty that Sancho paid little attention to. So they drafted up something that would repair the relationship and he was just like... Mm, the, uh, the, the church, um, the church and did. Portugal, Portugal, and they yeah. put it to him and he was just like, no. Well, he drafted the, it with them. Because I believe, I think I know a bit about this, the first rule was like, the first command was like, thou shalt not sleep with their cousins. Don't I'm of so. course making that up. but <laughs> Now, another thing he paid little attention to was the common people in Portugal, the middle class of merchants and pretty much anything but military tactics and war. This meant that he became an unliked king and soon enough talk began of civil war and planned to overthrow the king. I always find it a shame that like when there's a leader like Alfonso Mm -hmm. who was, he had a tough upbringing but he became like this really good leader and he fought off their supposed enemies and stuff like that and he built the country up and then they have children or their grandchildren who are the complete opposite of them and completely mess everything up. It must be like super sad for them. Had they been alive to, so true. to see it. 
So as he had no heirs, the person to overthrow the king and next in line was his younger brother. Can you guess his name? Oh, Alfonso or Sancho? Or it was Alfonso. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Alfonso was never intended to inherit the throne. And at the time of the debacle, he was living in France with his wife, Matilda, the Countess of Boulogne. Living his best life probably. Yeah. Again, and that's another thing. No with responsibilities. Royals, the second or third in line, like brother or sister or whatever, are usually off living a pretty mm-hmm. good life doing not much. So it's like, why would you want to take the throne? Yeah, Your life's absolutely. pretty good probably, I assume. So the conflicts in Portugal became so intense that the Pope, Pope Innocent IV, stripped Sh- Sancho Pope of his Innocent title. Pope Innocent IV. I was just going to gloss over that name. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> Innocent? No one is innocent in the eyes of God. How dare you? What well, he's arrogant the Pope. Pope. He should no, be innocent. No, no, no one is innocent in the <laughs> eyes of God. So he stripped Sancho of his titles as king and ordered Alfonso to take the crown. Since Sancho was not a popular king, the order was not hard to enforce. Sancho was exiled to Castile and Alfonso III became king in 1248 after his brother's death. So I presume he was like ruling... While his, brother, his was brother died. In, while his brother was in exile. Yeah. That seems like the, just the go-to. Just if there's a problem, exile, exile that person. Yep. Rather than deal with it. So it's a bit of a dog act, the next one. After the title was officially Alfonso's, he ditched his wife Matilda and moved up in the world, marrying Beatrix of Castile. A illi- cousin? Illegitimate daughter of Alfonso V, king of Castile. So they do like to keep it in the family. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I'm not even going to try and... There's a lot track, of connections track where that, but that's, that's within Portugal. the family, yes. yeah. Gross. Mm-hmm. He did not want to make the same mistakes as his older brother and paid special attention to what the middle class, who was composed of merchants and small landowners, had to say. He held the first session of a general assembly comprising of nobility, the middle class and representatives of all mu- municipalities. Municipalities. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> He enacted laws intended to restrain the upper class from abusing the poorer class and found several towns around Portugal. So, so he's a man of the people. Yeah. He actually ruled how you would imagine a ruler would, like he spoke to the people and he made sure everyone was cared for and things mm-hmm. like that. But it doesn't matter because probably he'll have a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter that will undo it all because that seems to be the pattern. Well, let's keep listening. Oh. Alfonso was then followed by King... Sancho? Dennis of De- Portugal. <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> now, Alfonso, a lot of these names are... son, Sancho, Dennis. <laughs> That's not a the most noble names name. names are, um, like, westernised for I was say, English isn't ears, I but they're similar to what they were. But I'm gonna, I am was going to say, Dennis isn't exactly a... I don't know. I'm not fluent Dennis in Portuguese or anything, but it doesn't sound like a Portuguese. <laughs> that sounds like a... I don't even know what origin that is, but it's, it doesn't sound Portuguese. So King Dennis, Dennis was oh, a well. Let me guess. Was he a menace? Was he Dennis the uh, menace? And this is where the origins of Dennis the menace come from. Well, he was actually a well-respected oh, king sad. and enjoyed writing poetry. As you, as a Dennis would do. <laughs> he worked hard to improve the econ- economy and Portuguese agriculture and ordered the planting of a large pine forest that still exists today. Dennis ruled Portugal for over 46 years and made it his mission to make Portugal great again. Well, it sounds like he did what uh, most leaders should do and he led well, but I think he's got the best legacy that you could have as a leader Mm -hmm. is that he didn't make any waves. He wasn't super amazing where he was controversial or he wasn't super bad where people hated him. He just did the right job. Go, Dennis. I'm all about Dennis. You may have talked too soon. Oh, no. See, Dennis had a son and his Mm. name was... Uh, Alfonso. I was going to say like Gavin or <laughs> no. something like that. <laughs> he was his son and heir, but he was not his favourite son. Dennis's oh, favourite wow. son was his illegitimate heir, Alfonso Sanchez. So don't get them confused. There's Alfonso and Alfonso Sanchez. <laughs> what is with these rulers and just, I just need a bit on the side. I just need it, okay? I'm going to go have an illegitimate heir to oh, sum There up was a, one that had over 18 children that were documented. Is there like a link between... Royals and being sex addicts or something? Maybe. Or, or were they just like, I don't know, they were so powerful and had so much time in their hands, they were just like, I'm just going to get it on with anyone and everything. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Dennis, you were so, doing so well. Uh, this led to the brothers qu- quarrelling. <sighs> Often yep. when royal 
perhaps quarrel. This usually means civil war, which is exactly what happened in the case of both brothers viciously fighting for their place on the throne. Well, we mentioned, um, what's the Netflix show we mentioned with the Duke of Hastings? Bridgerton. Oh, Bridgerton. They, um, some royals, they weren't royals, but whatever they were, they settled their dispute with a duel. Why didn't duel. They, Why didn't the princes just do that? They're too good for that. They need oh, we're, whole we're, armies. We'll fight. We'll, we'll let hundreds of people <laughs> die for us. Pretty instead. much. Yeah. Pretty much. Sounds about right. It was only in 1325 when Dennis died that Alfonso IV, Dennis. not Alfonso Sanchez, claimed the throne and exiled his brother to Castile and stripped him of everything. <laughs> so which one won? Because they're both called Alfonso. The legitimate heir. Oh, so right. That we think happened unless they switch places. Face oh, off. They're not twins. Well, they got the same name. <laughs> And the winner is Alfonso and everyone's like, which, which means <laughs> what? They're like, the legitimate one. Oh, okay. Maybe if Dennis had been a better role model, then we could only hope Alfonso would have been a better family man and might not have made a choice that led to what we can only be described as a Shakespearean tragedy. So we thought he was a good guy and he was a decent ruler, but he just liked to... Mess around with other women and create lots of children. And so what his son is going to be causing issues in the future. Yes. Okay. That sounds about on par for everything that's happened so far. That leads us to part three, the epic conclusion. I'm ready. Almost epic conclusion of the dynasty. All right. Did you you say dynasty? (laughs) Amazing. I I know you didn't mean that, but... (laughs) Oh, my God, a dynasty. It needs to be dynasty. It's more like Alphonsty, but that doesn't have as good a ring to it. Part three, a story of love, deception and a corpse. Oh, no, sleeping with your cousin's corpse? Ew. Well, these these royals are messed up. Mm -hmm. So now it's time for our feature story of today's podcast. And be prepared, this is often referred to as the greatest love story in history. Featuring a corpse? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm I'm with you for now. So yeah, I'm not so sure, but you can be the judge, Aaron. I'm I'm well looking forward mm-hmm. to being the judge. So the story of Peter the First of Portugal, who is Alfonso's fourth heir. Sometimes he's also called Pedro, which I like better. Pedro, yeah, that seems more fitting than. But Peter, I'll claim Peter. Than Peter. <laughs> so Peter was born in 1320. Alfonso had high hopes for his son and arranged a marriage with only the best. The Constanza Manuel of Valina, daughter of a powerful Castilian aristocrat. I love how the word I stuff up there is powerful. <laughs> Out of all those words, yeah. You probably practiced that several times <laughs> when you were reading it. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. Outside the family gene pool, this one, it sounds like it is. Mm, no idea. I'm not sure. I'm, not sure. I'm, sort we of, can I'm find thinking that out. it's outside the gene pool for once. Possibly. In 1340, Constanza arrived in Portugal and I'm sure excited about her new prospects and chance to one day be queen. She arrived also with her lady-in-waiting. With this choice, Constanza would unknowingly start a very strange chain reaction. What's a lady-in-waiting? So, just a... Like a maid? Yeah, but a high up maid, like someone like who's sort of a, your best mate that hangs around you and basically, helps you yeah, make yeah. sure your dress is nice yep, and your hair is absolutely. nice and stuff. So a slave, but, but best friend slave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one that you get lots of respect for and uh, pretty much like she's powerful, but not as powerful as you. Like. Today you'd call it like an assistant. Yeah, but she's also from a good family. Your lady in waiting came okay. from you'd a call really good assist- family. An assistant from a good family. Yeah, today. Yeah. Sure. The lady-in-waiting's name was Inez de Castro, who was a beautiful and aristocratic Aristocratic? daughter of a prominent Galatian family. So let me guess, she's going to cause issues because she's beautiful and the king's going to have an affair with her? Well, not the king. Oh, sorry. The prince The prince, sorry. Yes. Inez and Alfonso soon started what articles had led me to believe was a rather raunchy affair. As you do, yeah. Mm. You wouldn't be a ruler or a prince or a king or a queen if you didn't have an affair. I mm. mean, that's par for the And they course. pretty much started it straight away. So as so soon like, as he was married. So like, yeah, oh, my new wife and your lady-in-waiting, wife step aside, lady-in-waiting, yep. come in here, please come to my chambers. So they did keep it pretty well under wraps and tried to keep it as secret as they could. Yeah, sure. In 1345, Constanza gave birth to a son that would one day become the next king of Portugal. 
Is that his wife or? Yes, that yes, is yes. his wife. And only a few weeks later, she would die. Oh. Um, under suspicious circumstances or? That's or is it just convenient unrecorded. for the prince? He was just like, yes, yes, <laughs> nice. So this gave Peter the chance to be with his love. But not so fast as the old king, Alfonso, didn't just know about the affair but started to get concerned about the powers that Inez, Inez was holding over his son. Oh, power mm. play. So you think she was like a, a con woman? Oh, who maybe. knows? As any great ruler would do, the king banished Inez from court and started to arrange a new marriage for his son. Exile seems <laughs> to be the way. <laughs> seems the to be the only of way. Operandi. His son in turn refused and dismissed any fair maiden that would come his way. It's not fair, Daddy. You can't not do fair. that to me. It's not fair, Daddy. <laughs> you can't send her away. I love her. I imagine it's sort of like Cinderella. Yeah. They have this big ball and he's like, no, I only want her. Yeah, so, sort of like um, Bridgerton. Not like Bridgerton, it's no. Like, no. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Bridgerton, yeah. So the prince eventually made the decision to move in with Inez and live with her in, a, in secret as a married couple. You can't control me, Dad. I'm going to move in with her. We're going to start a family together. Pretty much. We're going to have our own lives. I hate you, Dad. (laughs) So the couple had three children together. And, of course, their union was disapproved by his father and even the courts. So the whole court His father probably disapproved. He's like, how dare you have children Mm -hmm. with someone who's not your cousin and in our bloodline? (laughs) How dare you do that? How dare you be a normal person? So by all accounts, they were a happy couple and Peter even began to get chummy with her family. Oh, nice. In particular, her scheming brothers. Who he had an affair with. Why not? Um, he just having affairs with maybe everyone. Maybe he was Why just not? attracted to the family. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. So they, through Peter, charmed their way to high titles and positions. They were even granted the position of Peter's close advisors. So they were probably a well-off, reasonable family, mm. but they saw their opportunity like we're going to climb yeah. up and Yeah, get they're yeah, definitely not, not as high as would be required for a queen, but... But they're like, we may as well jump on the yeah, ba- bandwagon and... Yeah, why not? Absolutely, you do that. So them becoming Peter's close advisors was the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, the king's not going to like that. Mm-hmm. Inez's brothers were of Castilian uh, background. And it was feared that in the event of Peter becoming king, the Castilians would have a claim on Portugal. Ah, power mm. play. So they, they maybe they were trying to do that. Like, well, let's, let's have a go. So Alfonso did as any king would do. The story goes that in 1355, Alfonso sent three men to find Inez at the monastery of Saint, Santa Clara a Vala in Coimbra, where she was detained, apparently tortured, and then finally decapitated this was said to be in front of her three young children. Yeah, that sounds par for the course again. That sounds about right. You think? Well, it's like um, anytime there's a problem, as we've found out, mm-hmm. exile. If exile is not strict enough, just kill them. Yep. That seems to be the theme. So some dispute the details of this, but in any case, Alfonso ordered the death of his son's beloved. So he's just killed the wife. hmm I would have thought also you'd probably take out the kids as well. Oh my god, they're not. But that then again, horrible, they're surely. sort of his grandchildren, even and if they are from the not preferred. Also, there's already an heir, so I don't oh, think yeah, he's true. that. Concerned. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, he did have a a child with his wife. Yeah, mm. I forgot about that. So this news caused Peter to go into a rage, and he wanted to wage war with his father. Unfortunately, the Queen Mother talked him down and Peter bid his time until the King's death in 1357. Could you go on just like living happy families with your father after yeah, he ma- ordered that. the death of your love? Yeah, you're just sitting there it's like, so yeah, you killed my, my one true love. Yeah, I did. Okay, pass the salt please. <laughs> How's the uh, kingdom anyway? Dad? Murderer? <laughs> Alfonso, stop it. <laughs> Sorry, mum. Mum, he, he killed. He killed my one true love. Like, what do you want me to do? Yeah, no, you couldn't possibly do that. No, but he did. He bid his time. Was was it only a few years later that his father died? Mm. I suppose people died pretty young back then. So, so yeah, he only died two years after this yeah. event. Well, two in years is a long time. It's to, a long time to be chummy with your dad. Yeah, after he killed your one true love. So after this, it is said that Peter ordered the arrest and execution of Innes' murderers by ripping their hearts out because of what they 
that is what they had done to his own heart. Don't you think they would have, like, seen the writing on the wall and gotten out of there? They were just like, well, we killed her and he hates his dad. And you would think so. presumably hates us. Mm-hmm. He'd probably get out of there somehow, some way or another. Now, other sources do say that those responsible for Innes' murder were already long gone by the time Peter took the crown. Yeah. And we're actually already dead, so... Mm. That story so who died then? <laughs> unsubstantiated. Mm. Wow, wasn't that a wild ride, Aaron? It was. It, quite uh, an interesting mm. bit of uh, incest yep. and, you yep. know, yep. people it's, using it's the not same over. names. Oh, it's not over. There's it more. is not over. Oh, there's a mower. There's mower. Okay. According to legend, Peter had Innes's body exhumed for his coronation. Oh, this she is was dressed in the finest jewels and clothes that money could buy. Peter recognised her as the Queen of Portugal and made those in court kiss her dead and probably decomposing hand. What a beautiful um, love story. Messed up. <laughs> That's weird. But did he have the head as well because she was decapitated? Mm, did he have that question. just in a basket? Historians have asked that as well. Um, in a basket beside her body? <laughs> so this story as well is unsubstantiated. Historians aren't too sure if that's what happened, but he did indeed have her body exhumed. And moved from the monastery where she was buried to one closer to home. Um, he built two magnificent tombs together so they could rest next to each other. When he finally passed forever. away. So I'm just going to go back to the fact that even though they don't know if mm-hmm. it's true, him, him exhuming her body and putting it like on the throne with him. Mm-hmm. Imagine like coming in, it's like, doesn't the queen look ravishing today? To yes. the person, they're like, ah. Uh, <laughs> I said, doesn't (laughs) the queen look ravishing? Yes, yes, my lord. Kiss her hand. But kiss her hand. (laughs) Doesn't she smell ravishing? (laughs) You you can see where I'm going with this. It would have been weird (laughs) as. And imagine the extra gory detail of her head being decapitated. Yeah, it's just on this little cushion beside him. It's just like stroking it like a cat. Oh, yuck. I love my queen. The crown's just on top of her, like, neck stub. Yeah, so they're not sure if that happened. No. But it's there's every chance it could happen because there's some weird, mm-hmm. weird stories like that. And one little detail. He had the words, until the end of the world, inscribed on her tomb, which Aww, I think is lovely. So he, he did love her. Yeah. But the politics, the politics of royal families getting in the way of everything all mm-hmm. the time. So why do all these love stories always end with a grisly death? Is that the only love story there is? Does there have to be death and murder? You very rarely hear of the ones where it's just like, and he came into power and he was a really good leader yeah. and he stayed with his wife forever. Why is this known as a great love story? Yeah, I don't know. Mm. It's full of lots of tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> it's very sad. So we usually end with a few extra facts, but today I'd like to end with some of the titles the kings were given. Each king. Each king oh, mm-hmm. in the story, mm-hmm. yep. Okay. So Alfonso I was, of course, known as the conqueror or the father of the nation. That makes sense. He, he seemed like he was pretty with it, like he was okay. Sancho I was known as the populator. The populator. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yep, interesting. Okay. Alfonso II, the fat. The fat. It, the lawgiver. Like, the what? The, the lawgiver. Law was he the good one that, like, fixed everything up? I can't remember, but... Being known as being the fat one means you probably didn't do a lot. I think I'd rather be known as the fat one than the leprous, which is his other name. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, Sancho II, the caped and the pious, which is nice. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He was the good one, mm-hmm. wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, Dennis the, the first. The menace. Sorry, go on. The farmer. The fa- <laughs> Dennis <laughs> the farmer. The farmer. Alfonso the fourth, the brave and the bold. Yeah, that's... Seems Peter the first, the cruel, the enemy son, the stutterer. The stutterer? <laughs> the till the end of the world passionate. Wow. Well, yeah. So he's the one that had the body exhumed? Yep. The stutterer. <laughs> yeah. And then just to add insult to his uh, injury, his son Ferdinand the first was known as the handsome and the inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> what, what sort of title is that? Our leader, in? he sure is handsome, inconsistent, but handsome. <laughs> Or our leader's fat, our leader is a great farmer. <laughs> These are strange titles. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode of His and Hers History, told in the His and Hers History way. I did. I, as I said at the top, I don't know much about Portugal. I know enough now. It's I know a bit enough of a roller coaster. Now, I know enough now to know that the Portuguese 
uh, royal family or their history is not unlike any others. Yep. There's lots of incest. There's there's death. There's um, affairs. Yeah, it has Corpses. Fair share. There's corpse brides that um, get exhumed and stay on the mm-hmm. throne with you and you pat their head like a dog. <laughs> I made that bit up, but that's what I'm imagining it's like. <laughs> So hopefully you found it fun. And if you would like to listen to more episodes, you can find us on all good podcast streaming apps. We are found with His and Hers History No Spaces is the best way to find us. We are also on Instagram and Twitter as well as YouTube. Feel free to like, comment and follow our podcast on whatever platform suits you and leave any feedback or ideas that you have for us. Don't forget to share our podcast if you have enjoyed it. By doing this, you can help us build our community and we can continue to provide you with some entertaining looks at a variety of historical topics. We sure can. And I forgot to mention at the top, this is our 10th episode. It is our 10th episode. This is a massive for us. Go us. This is a massive for us. This is a massive for us. Do you have a clue for next week? Sorry? Do you have a clue for next week? I do have a clue for next week. It's not really a clue. I'm just going to flat out tell you what it is. Oh, okay. Because you obviously need to know. We were doing clues, but okay. Well, this week it's not going to be a clue. We're (laughs) going to talk about Australia and Australia. Australia. How appropriate that my um, colloquial accent comes in there. But we're going to be talking about um, the larrikin, which is like the Australian term for someone who's a bit silly, you know, a bit wayward. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at the history of that and a few characters that help form that that sort of image of. Why Australians are seen as the lovable larrikins. Very nice. So, yeah, should be fun. Can't wait. I think that brings us to our end, Darren. It does. I'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Catch ya.